Provided that I am not this lady, and I'm not here to sell you the uh, latest uh, retro-futuristic uh, micro-oven that uh, saves space um, in your kitchen, uh, what is a, on earth is a space maker? So am I an experience designer, an exhibit designer, an architect, a technologist, a filmmaker, a scientist, or an alien from Sicily? Um, so uh, what is space making, and why are we talking about this today? Uh, space making is, comes from uh, the coming together of three disciplines, storytelling, technology, and architecture. And why is this relevant? Um, well, through a chain of event that reminds me of the butterfly effect, I started on a romantic trip to Venice, um, after which I had a car accident, and then I met a car driver, and then I ended up at the MIT Media Lab. And if you're curious about how the chain of event was, talk to me at the uh, end of uh, uh, at the end of the day today. But um, I ended up at the Media Lab in the mid-90s, and at the time, um, Nicholas Negroponte had just gone, um, we were talking about the next generation of the architecture machine. Um, speaking of futurists today, after Ray Kurzweil, certainly Negroponte has been one of the most influential people in technology. And what the architecture machine was, it was a book to redefine the mission of architecture to encompass uh, not just a generation of form of shape, which is what architecture is obsessed with today, but fundamentally to think about architecture as an enabler of human communication using technology. And so in the, um, in, the, uh, in the mid 90s, we were already seeing the use of technology as a way to enhance human creativity, to empower us with new ways of thinking at things. And so in, in the mid 90s, the mission of the architecture machine um, took an extra step and, and the challenge there was to think about what happens when the space becomes an enabler, not just of digital communication, but also of artistic expression. And so my answer to that, was that what happens is a new genre of storytelling. And this is a kind of storytelling that no longer happens on the film plane, uh, but in the space in which we move, we see things, and we operate as embodied beings. And um, so the, when, I, when I try to define what I do, um, sometimes it, it's hard and I have to tell a story and so forth. So somebody said, you need, um, you need new words. You need a new vernacular to describe what you do. And I, I realized I needed a new word to, to describe the, the meaning of these disciplines. And the new word was space maker. But I stole it. I confess. Um, I, I stole the, the, the word. This uh, comes from an, an article that Randall Walser uh, wrote back in 1990. It was uh, in a famous... Um, uh, a paper called Elements of a Cyberspace uh, Playhouse, and, and the paper was about virtual reality and all the promise of the virtual reality had for us. Um, it's interesting to talk about the exponential effect of innovation because when I uh, was at the lab, we thought virtual reality was the next thing to happen, uh, but no way, still not here. But what is a space maker? And what, what Randall Walter uh, wrote was a, spa a space maker sets up a world for an audience to act directly within. Thus, the space maker can never hope to communicate a particular reality, but only to set up opportunities for certain kinds of realities to emerge. So it's this idea of emergent storytelling. So let's talk about the first dimension of this in architecture and how did I end up here in LA. Um, there's a citation uh, that Bill Mitchell, the uh, former dean of uh, the MIT Architecture School wrote. He wrote, architecture is no longer simply the play of masses and light and now embraces the play of digital information in space. And so how does this turn into reality? Um, I come to SIGGRAPH and uh, one out of two years and now one out of three years, SIGGRAPH is in LA and one year I got a call uh, from somebody who knew Frank Gehry and Frank Gehry was actually one of the three finalists uh, for this project that transformed Singapore. It was a $5.2 billion project to design the casino and resort um, and a museum out of uh, Sentosa, this island out of Singapore. And I was asked um, to contribute to the design and technology of a space, which was a museum, and the issue there was how do we blend real spaces and virtual spaces? How can we create a space that is still real? It's not virtual. I don't believe in virtual space. I believe in augmented reality in enhancing our communication power. And that was our answer to that. And I'll play the video as I speak. And so our answer to that was to create a space where um, the real aquariums in the, um, in the space would be blended with virtual spaces. And so the idea is that you go by the shark and uh, the shark comes at you. And, 
Um, and then you have that kind of emotional response that predisposes you to um, an aesthetical experience and to learning more about um, the story of nature and the marine landscape in Singapore. So this is my path. I, I started my path at the MIT Media Lab in 94. In 2002, I started my firm, um, uh, Sensing Places. And um, really, uh, the lab was about learning um, in the equation of things, the interaction element of things. And I was uh, an academic. And look at the dates of this paper, 96, 99, 2000. We were already thinking about uh, the space is having eyes and ears and really capturing what people are doing in the space and thinking about how we can actually uh, get the space to react um, to the things that we do and adapt to us as we live in the space. And, and so there was this vision of, of really uh, spaces having eyes and ears and enabling any kind of um, uh, gesture and interaction and, and human action. I started working um, with, uh, with museums. I did uh, uh, f my first museum exhibit with MoMA back in 2000. And the mission um, that, um, that I wrote, uh, one of the uh, company mission was we envision and work towards making the museum visit indistinguishable from watching a movie or a theater play. Obviously, this movie is slightly different from the ones we are accustomed to. It unfolds the story as we wander around the museum space and yet it is as engaging and immersive as the traditional movies. So what am I talking about here? I'm talking about a new genre. And what is the, the grammar and language of this new, uh, this new genre? And obviously this is not something um, that anybody can answer by sitting down and writing a book about it. And you have to sort of welcome all the challenges that you have in your profession in designing all this new generation of uh, communicative or artistically communicative space to try and, uh, and articulate that new language. So here's another challenge. Um, so in the Gary project, the challenge was that to uh, design a hybrid space. Um, and here instead, um, I had an interesting challenge um, uh, for, um, for actually uh, an exhibit that I designed. This ended up being Moments on Private House exhibit in, uh, in, the, in 1999. We got, uh, MIT got the uh, gold medal from President Clinton um, for the, uh, one of the first interactive tables that was designed. And here, the issue, um, the, the exhibit before that, it was an architecture exhibit designed around uh, Louis Kahn. And the challenge there was, how can you virtually stretch the space? Uh, so we had an exhibit in which you had to, lo to show a lot more artwork than the space physically could contain. And how do you do that um, in such a way that you don't just put computer screens and you make the public really engage with the material? And I'll just uh, start uh, show a uh, show little video of that. So the trick here was to, um, to, have, to have people connect the uh, surrounding architecture with the floor plan. And then we had these uh, 3D prints of building with our FIDs underneath them. So you would select a building, put it in the center table, and then the surrounding screens would be showing the, computer um, vision techniques the corresponding renderings. Allows Another uh, call that I got a couple of years ago was to help design the um, Elvis Hotel in Las Vegas. And that's a hotel that's going to be on the main strip. And how can technology really contribute to creating a memorable space uh, for this hotel? And so we, since we are, we're good at um, uh, sort of uh, using cameras to track people and things in space, and, and we're good to the extent that we, we can track camera and people independently of lighting conditions, you know, with, within reason. Uh, one of the things we thought we could do, Vegas is all about these big screens, we could track cars and then have um, the screen split its time between showing advertising and being this huge sort of artistic installation. Um, and, um, and then eventually uh, interact, uh, use, uh, we could do some of Pablo's uh, sniffing technology to sniff uh, people's uh, uh, interest profile from their phone and then advertise both on their phones and they're um, using the billboard. So here is uh, on the right a visualization of cars that go in front of the building facade and then animate the facade as if each car was a stone uh, thrown in water that generates ripples. Um, and so there is this idea of really making even the outer environment uh, response to the presence of people and things in the space. And there's this idea of the building having a skin um, that responds to the outside event. This was uh, the project that got us introduced in LA. It's an interactive floor for a dance performance at Red Cat Theater um, in LA. 
And we didn't, go, we didn't want to do any sophisticated graphics, but here the challenge was to make each dancer look like a spider crawling on a spider net and then having the spider net uh, react in, in real time. I had a different idea initially. I wanted to um, give uh, people the impression that the, the dance stage uh, was uh, a membrane, an elastic membrane, that it was liquid. And that was the original graphics, but then the, the dancers punted. They said that they felt like throwing up. So, so we had to toss that idea, and I said, how, how about you guys are spiders? And they looked at me funny, and then, but we turned, uh, we turned it into this uh, uh, sort of responsive uh, spider net system. And in the uh, minute that I have left, um, I, um, I wanted to uh, talk about the cinematic component and the cinematic uh, aspect of things. And in this respect, uh, sometimes I describe my work as the, the converse of Wim Wenders' work. It's sort of the same path, but taken from, from the outside in. And what, what Wenders says, um, he, uh, when I began filming, I thought of myself as a painter of space engaged on a quest for time it never occurred to me that this search would be called storytelling. My stories start with places, cities, landscapes, and roads. A map is like a screenplay to me. And so another of the um, uh, challenges, and so the challenges that I got was, um, I, I got this call um, from these people in Spain and they said, well, we, we need to design a special space and, and we heard about you and what you do and here the challenge is that we want to design a museum but we have a little problem, we have no objects to put in it. And, and how can you design a history museum um, that's done with taste, that's, that's not like a theme park. And so here the, the idea was, since it was a history uh, museum, uh, how do you create a place that allows you to go back uh, in time? And then when we, the way we think is how, you know, uh, can we turn the space into a time machine? basically, and then we started looking at clocks, and we ended up designing the space as, as an ancient clock, and then we even had the idea that this, uh, these platforms that hold the exhibit themselves, they would run as a clock, and that this clock would complete its cycle in 2,500 years, which is the number of years that um, uh, the city um, uh, has been uh, created. And then, since there's no, no object, we, we thought of uh, chaining the narrative um, in, this, uh, in this space of small video clips that concatenate with, with each other, a little bit like uh, domino uh, chips. And that through your um, uh, walking around the space, uh, people come out of doors, they come out of uh, unexpected places and tell you a story. And yet, how do we articulate that story? And we thought what would be interesting is to tell the story of everyday life in, in that village, and we thought, what are the dimensions um, uh, of life? How can we articulate a story? And we thought we would articulate a story around work, body, spiritual, entertainment, love, and so forth. These are the platforms. And we, we decided to come up with a number of storytelling machines. So this is a screen uh, that goes up and down on vertical poles, and instead of using traditional historic mannequins, as you slide the screen, uh, for example, you have it in front of the mannequin's stomach, you're gonna end up learning what people ate at the time. If you have it in front of somebody's head, you would have a historian tell you what people were thinking at the time. And then every five minutes, the time changes. And so what's gonna happen is, in the first five minutes, the historian is gonna tell you about what was happening in medieval times, but then in the next five minutes, seems you'll see, uh, t the, the historical time in the time machine switches and the same historian is gonna tell you about what people were thinking in modern times and then later in contemporary times. And so uh, the storytelling in the space happens through the use of these uh, storytelling machines. Uh, this is, for example, the archeologist's table in which you manipulate archeologists, the archeologist's finding, uh, again, to interact uh, with the storytellers in the museum. Um, there's an area even called like the, the love area and uh, a fog, an interactive fog screen. So I wanted to leave you for the rest of the day with uh, thinking how to make it happen and equation of core responsibility. Thank you for that. <laughs>